My name is Lorna Cameron. I work as a learning specialist here with The Learning Bar. I was an administrator and teacher for over 20 years before I joined the company. And I'm very proud of the work uh, that this company does around the world. Our staff and our customers, uh, we're all focused on giving all children the opportunity to thrive. And that is why I'm here talking to you today. So this is a, uh, the first in a series of webinars. And Nikki will tell you a little bit more about the following webinars um, at the end of this presentation. So during this webinar, I'll be discussing what our education system looks like today. Are we meeting our students' needs? So really thinking about that question as we move through the presentation. I'll go through a story of two young children and look at what influences their early outcomes. I'll discuss some of the common set of challenges facing the public school system and look at some of the key factors uh, that school districts can target to get all children on track to read by the end of grade three. Finally, I'll provide an overview of a reading and intervention program that is being used to create a better future for our children. Giving all children the opportunity to thrive. What drives us? I'd like to give you a brief outline of where we came from and why we are here. Dr. Wilms founded the Learning Bar 15 years ago after having worked in social development for about 40 years. Since the company's creation, Dr. Wilms has brought together a team of educators, researchers, literacy experts, and child development experts who all share the same vision and drive. It is this powerhouse of staff who are responsible for guiding national and international policy. Our team prides themselves on their work with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and the World Bank. The Learning Bar also partners with schools in 15 countries around the world, delivering professional learning and literacy and assessment solutions built upon the most up-to-date and relevant educational research. So the question is, is our education system meeting the needs of your students? Just take a minute and ask yourselves that question. So over the past 40 years, the education system policies and practices have changed. However, the main goal of educational policy remains the same, to improve student outcomes, reduce, um, excuse me, reduce inequalities associated with family background. With Canadian expenditure per student being the second highest after the United States among the G7 countries, you would think that the major advancements have taken place. The problem is they haven't. According to the PISA, Program for International Student Assessment 2018 report, Canadian reading scores have remained stagnant since 2000. 25% of children in Canada remain vulnerable. How is this possible? When you see this statistic or any other of the alarming data outlined from the national and inter international assessments, what is your first thought? What are we doing wrong? Do we have the right resources? Do our teachers have the right skills? These initial thoughts revolve around what schools can do. We know our teachers are working extremely hard. Current school improvement and policies are often targeted towards fixing an issue with these school effects, often in elementary or secondary schools. Just going to take a minute here to give you a little bit of a personal story. So I experienced this firsthand in my first few years of teaching. I had a student who became very frustrated in class one day. A quick conversation led him to let um, me know that he didn't like to be asked to read a passage in class because as he said, Ms. Cameron, I can't read very well. How could this be? We all have heard the phrase, we are all teachers of literacy, but I had no specialized literacy training in university. I was a home economics teacher, that was my specialty. It wasn't until many years after, about 16 and a half years at the secondary school, um, working with many students um, who were at risk, when I went to the elementary uh, system as a vice principal for the first time. At secondary school, I would ask myself, how can these students come to grade 12, or excuse me, grade 10, and not be able to read or not have strong literacy skills? It was then at the elementary that I saw firsthand 
the issues that teachers were experiencing in helping students gain literacy skills. There is something that we can do. As you know, informed intervention needs to happen much, much sooner. I'm gonna tell you a story here on the next few slides, and you can judge for yourself whether intervention at a later stage of schooling is as beneficial as in the early years. Meet Emily and Jacob. So Emily and Jacob are born in the same hospital. Their parents, friends from high school, are delighted and happy. They leave the hospital at the same time, both families heading home to different parts of the city. Jacob started daycare. He was introduced to books as a baby at home and experienced a vast range of activities at daycare that allowed him to really explore his environment and play. Emily was cared for at home with her grandparents, happy, but not with the same opportunities for social development with children her age. The two children start in different kindergarten classes, both fresh-faced and bushy-tailed. Jacob already knows the alphabet, how to spell his name, has a few friends in class, and has been exposed to lots of experiences that have really helped to nurture his early development. Emily enters kindergarten excited, enthusiastic. She's active and social, so her parents are not too concerned about her ability to learn and to keep up uh, with her peers. Even before they are introduced to their teachers, Jacob has started the year at an advantage to Emily. Jacob improves quickly in his reading and writing skills. His father provides support with homework when he can and reads to him at night. Emily lags behind. She's enjoying kindergarten, although she really isn't interested in trying to read yet. Her language and cognitive skills are similar to those of many three-year-olds. Her teacher has just started her teaching career. She is aware that Emily is not as engaged as the other students, and she is looking at ways to help her advance. She's just not entirely, entirely sure how to help. Obviously, Jacob and Emily are fictitious, excuse me, fictitious children. Their life course experiences from conception to age five are different, which can affect their future experiences as they make their way through school. If I were to continue this story, there's a greater possibility that Emma and Emily would face a real challenge learning how to read. With learning loss over the summer, she would potentially start grade one at least one year behind. Early grade one is a crucial turning point for children since approximately half of the essential coding and language skills required to become a proficient reader are taught in grade one. Without evaluation of our skills, followed by targeted intervention and support from her family and community agencies, there's a strong possibility that Emily will fail sorry, excuse me, fall through the cracks and not be able to read well by the end of grade three. Each of you here today probably know a Jacob or an Emily. The important takeaway here, excuse me, the important takeaway here is that the identification of specific pre-literacy skills as early as kindergarten can have a huge impact on the outcome of schooling. So what are the challenges facing our schools? Emily and Jacob's stories raises many issues that are facing schools on a daily basis. High levels of vulnerability. Emily is not alone. As I mentioned, 25% of children in Canada do not learn to read well by the end of grade three. In schools serving families living in poverty, such as hers, the percentage increases to a shocking 60 to 80%. These children face inequities and educational inequalities, including unequal distribution of academic resources due to insufficient school funding, lack of qualified teachers, books, technologies. These factors exacerbate the probability of low student outcomes. However, studies have found that approximately 89% of students living in poverty who read at grade, um, grade level by grade three graduate on schedule. Number two, low levels of early literacy development. Emily presented another barrier that educators are facing when students first start kindergarten, low pre-literacy skills. 
A key finding from an analysis done through our early years evaluation revealed that when children are nearing the end of their kindergarten year and set to begin grade one, their pre-literacy skills span at least four years. The intensive focus on literacy skills in grade one puts those children who still have not managed to catch up at the end of their first year clearly at risk. Assessments of Emily's foundational phonics skills were not captured over the course of the school year. This made it harder for her educator to target her instruction appropriately. When a child's instructional needs and the instruction delivered are not aligned, um, children can become bored, disengaged, and fail to really develop the confidence in their ability to learn. So again, acquiring those strong literacy skills by the end of grade three is a powerful protective factor against student disengagement and dropping out of school. Third one, outdated approach to teaching. There are decades of research dedicated to looking at which instructional practices are most effective at teaching children how to read. Is it balanced literacy or the phonics method? Major scientific advancements into literacy acquisition support that the systematic phonics instruction makes a bigger contribution to children's growth in reading than other alternative programs for providing on systematic or no phonics instruction. Our current curriculum and teaching practices have not yet aligned with the science of reading. Educators are not being given the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of how a child learns or, be, or being given the strategies to use to enhance their classroom practice. Four, inadequate professional learning. Although educator professional development is central to virtually all effective school-based improvement models, professional development and school improvement efforts are often fragmented. Meaningful, sustainable school improvement requires an understanding of current academic research on how children learn, what makes teachers effective, how to analyze student and classroom data to inform classroom practice, and the adoption of new teaching practices and uh, strategies to really uh, achieve improvement and a framework to set goals and measure success. Our current strategies for professional learning, which typically involve one or two day workshops and attending conferences seem to have little or no impact on learning. Think to yourself how often you may have said, you know, oh, I, I didn't really get anything from this day or I didn't take. So, you know, all those well-meaning, um, you know, sessions we attend, are they of benefit to, uh, to improving our teaching practice in the school? Imagine, if it didn't have to be the case, if, if that professional learning was valuable and provided the right um, interventions that you needed at the time. Number five, the lack of consistent measurements. Currently, the process or platforms used by some education institutions to capture factors that impact literacy success and student outcomes throughout childhood are inadequate. Data is captured on a vast variety of factors, but many of these do not have an impact on student outcomes, and they're not detailed enough to set or measure realistic goals, target interventions, and validate improvement strategies. The educators we work with were often talking about schools and they're awash with data. Sorry. So in Emily's example, her teacher did not have the tools she needed to identify and assess her skills, which hindered her ability to provide targeted instruction, allocate resources effectively to support her. So as Emily transitions to late primary grade four, there's a tacit assumption that she'll be able to really read fluently and understand the content of school subjects. She will be expected to read to learn. What I was thinking uh, when I was teaching high school and thinking, okay, that's gonna be covered in elementary. When they come to me in grade 10, every child's going to know how to read. But as I uh, relayed to you um, earlier with my example, that's not always the case. So she'll, as she progresses through school and she enters lower secondary, the demands for strong literacy skills to increase and she and other students who lack that fundamental reading skills father 
fall further and further behind. And this really can slowly lead to disengagement from school, poor mental health, and ultimately dropping out of school. And unfortunately, we know that we have seen this, we have experienced this, we have um, seen Emily's in our classrooms. So the takeaway here is it's clear that the challenges our current districts and schools are facing cannot be overcome by continuing to do the same thing. So we need a new approach. So getting all children on track. So cha really challenging the status quo. Now I'm asking you to think back to Emily and Jacob. What can we do to really balance their chances of reading by the end of grade three and reaching their full potential? We need to change the status quo in education, establish a culture of data-driven improvements. So the first of those is to measure what matters. Continuous monitoring and reporting of developmental and pre-literacy skills development allows educators to quickly assess the child's progress and immediately target instruction to address identified learning needs. Providing early intervention has the largest impact on a child's success of reading by the end of grade three. Two, really make early literacy skills the primary focus. So the development of children's reading skills needs to be the primary focus of educational modern systems. We need an early warning system and interventions in place for pre-kindergarten, kindergarten children that support it with strong literacy instruction. Three, improve the capacity building for educators. We need to empower educators and school leaders with the knowledge and skills to reduce the disconnect between how we are teaching children to read and how children actually learn to read. We need to provide all educators with literacy instruction proficiencies that are really proven to positively impact student success. Number four, make informed school planning and policy decisions. To create a better future for our students, we need to have the right information at the right time to make informed decisions. We know that getting all children on track to read by the end of grade three is possible. The questions we need to address first are, how can we get these students on track? How can we ensure that we catch those that need the most support? How do we know we are capturing the right information and that our interventions are really effective? At the Learning Bar, we believe that we can address each of these points. The Learning Bar has developed Confident Learners. It's a three-year reading and intervention program designed to markedly improve the reading skills of children from kindergarten to grade three. The program is focused on building educators' instructional leadership capacity, providing a structured and sequenced approach to literacy skill development, and using ongoing assessment to monitor progress and effectively guide instruction. Confident Learners is more than a stack of resources. The program uses data to put the power and the knowledge into the hands of educators and allow them to do the best for all their students. A piecemeal approach to addressing the gap in early literacy is not working. We need to build capacity for children's literacy success. We support education leaders in achieving this goal. Working together, we believe that we can help you transform the lives of your students and give all children the opportunity to thrive. Thanks for listening today. I hope I've inspired you to imagine really what it would look like to change Jacob and Emily's literacy path. 